coming to this uh, early morning session. Um, I'm going to present on uh, some of the stuff I've been recently doing at the University of East Anglia, but uh, this is an outgrowth of research I was doing three years uh, at University College London, and I got a small bit of funding to, uh, to continue pursuing some of the things that I proposed in a paper in antiquity that came out in um, December, basically looking at um, proposing uh, ways forward in the study of rock art in uh, northern South America broadly, but with a particular case study on the Artemis Rapids, which uh, mark the transition between the Middle Orinoco and the Upper Orinoco. It's the last point at which the river is um, uh, traversable. It doesn't matter whether you come in a jet ski, a canoe, or a galley, you have to get out at this point and take your craft around because of, the, because of the, these, these huge rapids. And basically, um, the, the paper proposed some links to indigenous cosmology and myth, uh, discussed some of the formation processes, the formation processes and the spatial organization of the art, and um, so it's, it's ongoing meaning and use uh, by uh, uh, indigenous people in the region um, today still, or not, or not in some cases. So, based on this work, what I'm aiming to do with network analysis with the short project at UEA is, is to really characterize on a larger scale what the commonalities and differences are in the rock art corpus of Northern South America. The broadly defined is what Ari Boomer called the Orinoco interaction sphere. But he actually said the, the lower Orinoco interaction sphere, and we took that to mean the sort of the areas to the south, so the Amazon, areas to the west, the Andes to the north, the Antilles and the, and the Caribbean, and to the west could be the Guianas. And the, the idea that the Orinoco has kind of flavors of all these regions that took far bits and pieces of the, um, I'll show more, more to this effect in just a second, but the, the Orinoco inflects everything from the surrounding regions in its own way and creates something new and then distinctively Orinoco. So the question then is, do commonalities or differences in, in, in the, the production and consumption of rock art indicate shared communities of, of practice surrounding, surrounding rock art? Uh, and ultimately, of course, we want to know, do archaeological networks that we identify map onto actual social generative processes in the past? That's kind of the pie in the sky kind of, um, objective. A bit more about the setting. Uh, this, yeah, so going back to what I just said, this intermediate area of the Orinoco unifies, unifies the surrounding areas in terms of uh, linguistics, uh, archaeological traditions and stuff. Um, it's a it's natural linguistic diversity hotspot, so each of these colors on, on the map is a language family. Each one of these is Indo-European, a Semitic, an Austronesian, uh, and it's, it's just an absolute mess. And it's probably due to uh, multi-ethnic communities, multi-linguistic communities are the norm now as in as in past of the contact period. Um, and this is probably because much interaction is being facilitated by the river network, the, the, the drainage of the Orinoco and the, the upper Danube and, and, uh, and uh, neighbor, neighboring river, rivers. The, the, the Orinoco is actually connected to the Negro, which is part of the Amazon through a through to distribute every uh, so it's possible to cro cross all these divides uh, in, in your own point, it seems. Um, that being said, there is an uninterrupted human presence since 12,000 BP, so we're not, I mean, I'm not talking about necessarily later um, cultures alone when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm discussing the rock art record, because there is indeed some very old archaeology associated with rock art here. Um, luckily, there's a long history of exploration. I couldn't resist putting this slide in because there's, uh, there's a we're in Germany. There's a distinctive German flavor to the to the, the history of research, from uh, starting with Alexander von Humboldt, who wrote about the about the, the rock art in the Middle Orinoco, followed by one of his his, his disciples, Theodor Koch Grunberg, in the, in the early uh, sorry, the later later 19th century and, and, and uh, 1900s. Much later on, Gerardo Dolmatov from, uh, from well, he's Austrian originally, but but. Uh, but did a lot of work in, in, uh, in the Kakata uh, River Basin with, with Tucano groups, looking at their, their, their consumption and production of, of art. Uh, uh, it's an ethnographic study uh, beyond the Milky Way, so, but it's, it's nonetheless um, it, it, it has a tremendous impact on our understanding of indigenous <coughs> art more broadly in Amazonia. And then much later in the 90s, uh, Cornelius Dubala, uh, who's, uh, who's Dutch, um, did a survey of the entire more, did, a, did a synthetic survey of all of northern South America uh, and the rock art sites found therein. So this this kind of corpus and that of later 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 archaeologists provides a 
um, uh, a rich, if a slightly fragmented, uh, database to start thinking about interactions along distances. So this is uh, where I am with my pilot database of 72 sites. Most of them are in gray. Uh, yeah, so petroglyph sites, and then 16 are, are painted with pictograph sites. Uh, the reason I haven't got further with this in the two months I've been doing this is that I got really, really bored of counting motifs. I got up to 1,609 individual motifs spread across these 72 types, grouped into 70, uh, 72 sites, grouped into 71 types, and I just got bored of counting. I'm going to return to it in my bit. This, but, but this represents the best quality data I can get my hand on, so full inventory of sites, not just kind of presence, absence of one or two motifs. Uh, it's fundamentally based on this glossary, uh, which, which is like sort of stared at it a bit, you know, stared at this for too long, too many hours in the office. I started to realize I'm kind of uh, it's a bit, bit Pokemon esque. So spiral one evolves into spiral two, spiral two becomes spiral three, and so on and so forth. And there's 71 of these, kind of my reading of what makes up a motif. Um, and what makes a variation of the motif, and how is this all internally consistent? Um, but like I said, there's, there's still tons to. There's one of the one of the larger sites in the Serenia de Chiriquita in, in, in uh, the Colombian Amazon, which is just huge. I can't even bear to look at that picture because I know it will take me about three days just to even get my head around, get get, get my eye into the into the photos I have. Um, so the questions I wanted to ask of this is essentially a big, a big table of, of counts uh, is to know how many connections does each, each site have to other sites, uh, it's, it's a degree essentially, um, based on the co-presence, both weighted and unweighted, weighting by the quantity of motifs in each site, and then um, the sort of similarity measures, formal indices of, of, uh, of, uh, of similarity between more of sites. And then, to go from there to which sites are the most connected, which sites are the most influential, important in the network, um, and then what is the structure of these kinds of networks based on inferred importance. Um, I use two uh, measures of similarity, Brain of Robinson, uh, which has recently been used quite fruitfully, I think, with uh, Southwest Social Networks Project, looking at similarity in ceramic assemblages across the Southwest for a period of, I think, 250 years and 50 year time slices. Um, interestingly, interestingly, one of the most famous applications of the Brain of Robinson Index, uh, uh, Mills and her team didn't, didn't develop it themselves, was in Lowland South America. So it was brought, brought to the fore by, by uh, Warren De Boer and colleagues to look at exactly the similarity between sites over, over different periods of time. And then second, the Jacquard Index, which is a classical index of, 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 uh, of similarity for, for categorical count data. So, some networks. Basically, this is all very new to me. <laughs> and I took, took, took a sick kitchen sink approach and just kind of threw, threw everything I could at, at, the, at the data that, that uh, I had and, and tried to spit out something that I could make sense of. So these are colored according to, the, the nodes in this are colored according to, uh, according to the number of connections, the degree of the, of the, um, of the network. And it's the three measures I started off with was, you know, was the degree for, for, for um, measuring connectivity in co-presence, the eigenvector, so that's the number of connections that the site, or the amount of connections the site has to other influential sites. So it's how influential it is within its local neighborhood, and then betweenness, which is, so betweenness is how often does a node lie on the shortest path between all other nodes. So, Nodes that are set very central in, in between, between the centrality networks are um, uh, they're brokers of information, they control flow, if you, if you like this. If you were to do this in a power grid, you probably want to distribute this out a little bit so if one pylon fails, you're not going to have a blackout on a large scale. So that's the kind of thing between the centrality is done for. Um, and then also the brain of Robinson coefficient and the Jacquard uh, index. So I, I sort of decided to, to discard uh, co presence. Networks because they penalize the way the code is written. It's not my code. It's Matt, Matt Peoples' code from his, his uh, very good tutorial on that with network methods and archaeology. Um, it penalizes very large sites because it's based on the proportion of individual motifs in a site. So if you have a very large site with potentially some, uh, so some of these very large painted rock art sites have uh, plants are very rare. Paintings of plants are very rare. But they tend to, when they do occur, they tend to occur in very, very large sites. Um, why? I don't know. 
But if I were to fight sea of blood in another side, if George thinks of a manioc or a maize stalk or whatever in another side, I would think, oh my god, that's really important. These sites have a, there's some implicit connection there of some nature between the two. But the algorithm wouldn't necessarily think of that because that <coughs> one plant in both sites is maybe 0.001% of the total uh, assemblage of motifs. So it discards it as a cutoff threshold before you even get to that stage of analysis. The, the Brainerd Robinson and the Jacqueline index also rely on this, this free parameter of a threshold, but we do it post analysis. So it determines the importance of, 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 a, of you know, the similarity of the site to all other sites, and then you say, well, okay, where, where do I want to start? Start you know, making a cut off. Uh, going back to this notion of, of um, uh, centrality and, and, and uh, <coughs> control in, in an overall flow of information, what I was interested in actually, to, to, to pursue my question, to mesh most closely with, with the, between the centrality uh, measure. How often does vertex lie in the path to all the vertices? Uh, try to look at this comparatively. Uh, the text is a bit small, but there's so highly connected sites, sites with, with um, high importance in the, between the centrality network are the yellow ones, these, these yellow, yellow dots. And there's almost no overlap between, okay, to get one for longer. Um, there's almost no overlap between the Jacqueline index and the Brain Robinson index. They're telling completely different stories about what's, what's uh, important to in, in, in these networks. Uh, and that probably says more about the analysis technique than any actual social generative process underlying the Rockcar network or my data collection or what have you. So if, if I have one takeaway message from this, is that sensitivity analysis is like super important. You need to know what you're asking. You need to permute through various different things. Think a little bit critically about why you're asking, what you're asking, why you're doing what you're doing. Um, taking sort of more than just the between the nodes, I wanted to know about um, flows of information on the edges. So uh, how similar are sites? Uh, so which edges, which, which links between sites are controlling the most amount of information. Uh, use this as a measure of community structure. I'm not entirely up to speed with the, the actual algorithm they use, but basically the, the sites are grouped based on uh, um, between the, centra the edge between the centrality. So uh, sites that are more highly connected, more central to the flow of information, quote unquote, in these networks are more likely to be grouped together. And this actually, the, these, these kind of, these colors are consistent between each, each kind of iteration, each, each threshold applies, 5% threshold of similarity, 10%, 15%. Um, in the South of a Social Networks project, they used a similarity threshold of 75%. Now, if I use more than 20%, these just don't dis dissolve. These really aren't, these really aren't all that, that similar when you compare, you compare them to these. Uh, the rock art networks aren't all that similar when uh, you compare them to, to for example, Ceramic style networks in the US Southwest. And this is a different different phenomenon that we're looking at. But this is where I, I kind of I think I'm starting to see patterns emerge. If I project this spatially, which I'm sorry I didn't have time to do, they kind of form highly central nodes are sort of on the edges of watersheds. They, they connect into the flow of a different river, presumably a different group of people are living in. It, it makes a little bit more sense. I'm going to be teasing out this more, more, more of this, um, teasing out more of this later. So it works, kind of. I mean, the code runs. I'm not sure it's showing me anything that I didn't already know, because you get intimately familiar with your data as you're collecting it. Um, the question is, does it work better than something like multiple correspondence analysis? I've been talking to Tom about doing something like this for maybe three or four years. CA Harris, maybe, so or maybe as much as five years ago. And he told me, don't do it. Like, just it works better doing other things. And I'm kind of coming around to his. Well, it took me five years to kind of come around to, <laughs> to what he said. Um, but some sort of validation measure is needed. Like, I don't, I don't know what that might be. Uh, some sort of bootstrapping technique, simulation technique to generate random networks and see how the empirical networks differ. I don't know. Uh, I need to think more about what metrics and techniques make sense for studying rock art networks. Um, I'm glad that there are other papers coming on this because I might learn something. Uh, and there's still a ton I have to do. So each of these, each of these um, ellipses are areas which I have. <coughs> loads of sites. I have 
a bunch of sites that I couldn't do, I can't do more than presence absence data for. Uh, but hopefully, uh, again, another reason that I've seen weird stuff in this analysis that I don't, can't understand in really archaeological terms is because uh, it's quite a small sample of the overall universe that I know exists out there. So I need to, uh, need to get on that. There's geographical weighting, which, oh, so geography has an influence on this as well, because people disperse and move through the river network, that's where contact takes place. It really sucks to walk through the jungle when you don't have machetes yet. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's basically where I am. Uh, if you liked it, tell me. If you think it's bad, tell me, and I will stop. Thank you. <laughs>